West Virginia, Appalachia. Look at these beautiful mountains. Every day, we use 5.5 million pounds of explosives to blow these mountains up for coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel. And we use coal for almost 50% of our domestic electricity. So we're all connected, whether we like it or not. What is mountaintop removal coal mining? The first step of mountaintop removal coal mining is clear cutting. Clear cutting the most biodiverse temperate forest on the planet. The next step in mountaintop removal coal mining, after they burn, the far, burn those trees and bury them, is to push the rich topsoil and all the loose rock that lay underneath those trees using giant machines over the edge of the mountain into the valleys below. Then you get to the mountain, to the bedrock. And now coal, it lays in horizontal seams like icing between layers of a cake. So that first layer of bedrock, after the trees are removed, after the dirt is removed, you get to that rock, and they begin to drill holes into that bedrock. And they fill those holes with a mixture of ammonium, nitrate, and diesel fuel, the same mixture used in the Oklahoma City bombing. And they blow that mountain up to expose the next layer of coal that lays beneath it. And they repeat that process, layer after layer, Blow the rock, take the coal. Blow up the rock, take the coal. Until those mountains are reduced to ashes. 500 Appalachian mountains are gone by mountaintop removal coal mining. Thousands of miles of headwater streams, the drinking water source for the southeast United States, are buried. And countless thousands of Appalachian communities and the people who live in them have been wiped off the map. This is a war against our mountains, and the Appalachian people are crying for our help. I first began my reporting on the human and environmental costs of mountaintop removal in 2005, after I met a woman named Maria Gano from Bob White, West Virginia. Three days after meeting Maria, I was at her home place in Bob White to witness what she had described to me that the coal mining operation, the mountaintop removal operation that moved into her backyard in the year 2000, how it had turned her life upside down. She'd been flooded countless times because once you remove the dirt, once you start removing the mountain, there's nowhere for that rain to go. And so when four inches of rain fell over four hours on, a, on an evening in the year 2003, Maria and her family were huddled together in the darkness in their home, helpless as the little big branch creek that she'd played in as a girl had turned into a raging river and cut a 67 foot wide swath through her yard, taken out her orchard, taken out two vehicular access bridges and ruined her well. Listening to Maria's testimony, being there on the ground changed my life. She was my shepherd, and she wasn't the only one. There were others who shepherded me through this hell on earth in West Virginia. One of the turning points was when, for me, and my radicalization through this subject was when Maria sent me down to Mingo County to the communities of Raw, Lick Creek, Sprig, and Merrimack, communities that had dubbed themselves the forgotten communities of Route 49. For 20 years, a Massey Energy subsidiary, Raw Sales and Processing, had been injecting coal slurry into underground abandoned coal mines around these communities. Coal slurry is the waste byproduct of the chemical cleaning of coal that is used today before the coal is sent to market and burned in the power plants. Coal slurry contains just about every element on the periodic table, heavy metals and all. And these communities, this coal slurry had migrated from where it had been injected underground into the aquifers from where these communities drew their drinking water. And for years, they were drinking coal slurry and didn't know it. But their communities had turned into virtual cancer clusters. What happens when you drink this stuff? 
You get intestinal lesions. You suffer from neuropathy, liver failure, kidney failure, cancers of all kinds, birth defects, miscarriages, brittle bones, general poor health. And I kept witnessing the incredible health and life hardships that the people were suffering because of the coal and because of when they stood up for themselves against this powerful industry, how they suffered there too. So the weight of the testimony that I heard from the West Virginians and everything that I had witnessed propelled me forward in my work, not only to continue my work, but to move to West Virginia to live and work in the field full time. After 10 years of being based in New York City, I moved to Rock Creek, West Virginia. At about the same time, a pressure cam campaign was invited into the group by locally affected people that I had also been working with. Climate Ground Zero, a group of activists who would use nonviolent civil disobedience to express their protest against the atrocities of mountaintop removal coal mining. I began a year-long journalistic embed with Climate Ground Zero, and I documented their campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience, and along with the activists, I was arrested three times. I was then personally sued by the third largest coal company in America at that time, Massey Energy, and Despite the temporary restraining order that they put against us through the courts, we kept defying that, that restraining order. And as a result of that, I was found in contempt and subject to fines. With the help of our pro bono lawyers, we made it through this legal engagement and awareness was being built. More people knew about mountaintop removal. We had Daryl Hanna come get arrested with us in the Coal River Valley. Dr. James Hansen from NASA, he was arrested with us in the Coal River Valley. And Bobby Kennedy and his crew were making a movie about it, The Last Mountain, about Coal River Mountain. But despite all of this, mountaintop removal was still going on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the last grab for all that coal they could get. At about this time, some studies began to come out of West Virginia University. Dr. Michael Hendricks and Ms. Melissa Ahern and their team began to look at the human health impact of coal mining, specifically mountaintop removal coal mining, and specifically the dust coming off of these sites. Now you know there's already the ammonium nitrate and the diesel fuel coming off, because that's what they use to blow them up. But there's also silica dust, that's rock dust from sandstone. If you breathe too much silica dust, you get silicosis, and you can die from silicosis. And of course, breathing coal dust will give you black lung. My neighbor, Bo Webb, he immediately saw the importance of these studies. These studies were confirming what we on the ground knew, that mountaintop removal was bad for us. And now these, these tests, these studies, were saying mountaintop removal was killing us. Let me just give you one example, one startling statistic. After a few, by the year 2010, there were 20 studies of this kind that had been published in peer-reviewed journals, and it was a large body of work. And we can understand at this point that if you are a non-smoking pregnant woman, but you live near a mountaintop removal site and you're breathing in that dust, you have a 180% greater chance of burying a baby with a birth defect compared to a woman who smokes cigarettes during her pregnancy. That is why we call it a health emergency. So Bo Webb, my neighbor, and his small team harnessed the energy and the information of those 20 health studies, and they built a campaign around it, the ACHE campaign, the Appalachian Community Health Emergency Act. They devised this campaign to educate members of Congress who are in the position to help us end mountaintop removal. 
And now we have a bill in Congress, the ACE Act, H.R. 5959. This bill will stop mountaintop removal coal mining. And we need your help to do that. Go to the ACEact.org, learn more, sign that petition. Urge your representatives to support this bill. We're strangled by the coal mono economy in West Virginia, but many other states aren't in this position, so we really need the help of the outsiders. Now, there are a couple of other things that you can do. You can come to West Virginia yourself. I invite everyone here. If you make the effort to come down to Rock Creek, we will take care of you and we will show you around. And you can witness and later testify for yourself. If you can't make it to West Virginia right away, look up on Google Earth. Look at Google Earth and look at Bob White, West Virginia, and see how those mountaintop removal sites surround the communities there, surrounding Maria Gano's home. Look up in Google Earth, Sundial, West Virginia, where the Marsh Fork Elementary School sits below a mountaintop removal site, at the toe of a dam holding back 2.8 billion gallons of coal slurry. It's seeping at the toe. And these children are in danger. And then go look at Kayford Mountain. Kayford Mountain is Larry Gibson's home place, the grandfather of the movement to stop mountaintop removal. And he worked for more than 20 years to protect his land. Now, it's a little island of green, 50 acres of pristine Appalachian forests surrounded by 188,000 acres of moonscape, of dead land. And that's what mountaintop removal does to the land. So you have a little bit of information now. You can find me on Facebook at Appalachia Watch. And I'll see you in the mountains. Thank you.